Hi, folks. Welcome to the Hugging Face on AWS and SageMaker Workshop. Uh, my name is Emily Weber. I'm a machine learning specialist. I've been at Amazon for four years, uh, and I've gotten to focus on SageMaker uh, throughout that time. Uh, and I hope you enjoy our session. Hi, this is Rishi. I'm a senior solutions architect with machine learning startups customers. Uh, I have been with AWS around three years, and my specialty is in machine learning and networking. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm an ML specialist solutions architect at AWS. I've been here about a year and a half, and I've got a real soft spot for NLP and model deployment. All right. And so with that, uh, we're going to move into the slide content. Uh, and so, so today is a hands-on workshop. Uh, the, the intention for today is we're going to have a very quick uh, slide uh, overview. We're going to get a quick recap of Hugging Face and Amazon SageMaker. That's going to include what Hugging Face is, uh, if you are new to this space, and the ways that you can use Hugging Face on SageMaker. Um, after that, we're going to get into what we call the event engine. Uh, event engine is a way that we can do workshops um, and hands-on labs at AWS. Uh, notably, those are going to be free, so you can, in fact, uh, run through the, the webinar and the workshop here today without using your credit card. That being said, uh, all the content is public. So if you would like to uh, download the, the workshop repository and then step through it in your own AWS accounts, you are welcome to do that as well. Uh, especially we're going to deploy a few pre-trained models to SageMaker endpoints. Uh, and we're gonna focus on GPT-2 actually. This is a, a text generation um, use case that we're gonna look at end to end. Uh, we'll also talk through different options for using Hugging Face for question answering or text classification or name density recognition. So let's get started. All right, so you've heard of Hugging Face, potentially. Um, you've heard that there is this new SDK, uh, this new technology uh, that's available for natural language processing, but but really, where did this come from? Uh, what's the, the underlying technology that makes Hugging Face possible? And, and the answer to that question uh, is transformers. And so, no, I am not talking about uh, robots that transform from cars into heroes to save the planet, uh, but I am talking about a new type of NLP model uh, that's been demonstrating state-of-the-art performance in the last couple of years. If you've been following uh, machine learning general press, machine learning literature, uh, you'll be aware that there's this new type of model and what's what's special about transformers. So transformers can run at really large scales. They're a new type of sequence model um, that can run at very large scale sets. So they can be very parallelizable, um, they have interesting ways of dealing with text, um, whether it's for mass language modeling or causal language modeling or attention masking. Um, but there's this really interesting core concept behind transformers, uh, which includes pre-training, so unsupervised pre-training, and then downstream fine-tuning. Uh, so the most common uh, model that's known in, in terms of transformers is BERT. Uh, so bi-directional encoding representation transformers, that's your BERT model. Uh, and your BERT model, again, starts with this unsupervised pre-training generally. So you take a corpus of text um, and you run this unsupervised mass language modeling on that unsupervised text. The part most customers are going to be interested in is actually this fine tuning process, uh, where after, again, we've completed that large scale pre-training, uh, we're going to fine tune our model on a variety of downstream tasks. So we can fine tune it on question answering, on text classification, on name density recognition, text generation, et cetera. And the reason why this is interesting is that the results uh, are close to human level performance and in some cases are actually better. Uh, than human level performance. So what is Hugging Face? Uh, so Hugging Face is an open source community, is an SDK, is a corpus of more than 31,000 pre-trained NLP models. And uh, all of them, I'm going to say, uh, the overwhelming majority of these are using transformers. So Hugging Face, is the, the name of their primary SDK is actually transformers. Um, they just published a new book from O'Reilly in 2022. So you're welcome to read through this. Actually, I've been uh, spending the last couple months reading it. It's lovely. Uh, and so essentially, 
you can use Hugging Face to download models. You can use the tokenizers. You can use the data sets that come directly with those models. We have uh, 46 example notebooks and scripts that you can use to, pl to plug those onto SageMaker. Um, they actually include automatic code generation for SageMaker. Uh, and there's a really active open source community for Hugging Face. So the, again, we, we have a, a strong partnership between Hugging Face and SageMaker, uh, where we code, uh, we jointly develop products together. We jointly develop, uh, they're called the Hugging Face Deep Learning Containers. So you can use these base deep learning containers to both train and deploy your models. And so specifically, there's a lot you can do uh, with these deep learning containers. On the train side of the house, uh, you can fine tune your models. You can use, again, the deep learning containers for PyTorch and TensorFlow. Uh, you can tune them with automatic model tuning. You can compile them with the SageMaker training compiler. Um, they support multi-GPU and multi-node distribution. And you can also train from scratch. Uh, so when you come across a case where you need to actually train your own transformer from scratch, you're able to do that on SageMaker. You can also deploy models directly onto uh, SageMaker, again, from the Hugging Face Hub. So you can deploy them directly from the hub. I'm going to show you some code generation for that in just a little bit. Uh, we can deploy fine-tuned models from S3 Again, support for PyTorch and TensorFlow. We can auto scale these. So when you create your SageMaker real time endpoints from that base Hugging Face model, we're going to auto scale that onto multiple instances. Uh, we support serverless endpoints. We support asynchronous endpoints, multi model endpoints, and inferentia. You can also operationalize uh, your Hugging Face models on SageMaker. That includes building pipelines, uh, that includes generating inference recommenders for pipelines, uh, integration with third party ML ops stacks, and then uh, monitoring for bias. So you can use uh, SageMaker Clarify to detect and then monitor for bias in NLP uh, using, again, SageMaker Clarify and Hugging Face. And so how do you pick the right Hugging Face model? Again, we know there are tens of thousands of these. Uh, so generally, I like to start by trying to add the most value to my organization that I can. Right? I think about what does my organization care about? What are the goals of my organization? Uh, where's the most common traffic? Like, where do we have a lot of volume? Uh, that typically leads to where do I have a data set? Uh, where do I have a natural tax data set that is... I'd say at least at least 10,000 lines. You can do a lot with 10,000 lines. Uh, it doesn't have to be terabytes and terabytes. If you have terabytes and terabytes, you can fine tune your own model, which is kind of fun. Uh, but so you want a data set. You want to ask yourself, uh, is my data set primarily English? Uh, or do I need to integrate multiple languages? Uh, is my data set specific to a certain domain? Like, does it have uh, a lot of syntax? Does it have a, have a lot of jargon or terminology uh, that is, again, very specific to my domain and isn't generic? Like, can I find this terminology on most Wikipedia articles? Uh, and if the answer is no, then I'm going to want to probably fine tune my model. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so you can find them on the Hugging Face Hub. Then again, uh, you can fine, tool, fine tune, scale, and train from scratch uh, using Hugging Face on SageMaker. So the visual here, uh, that's the Hugging Face estimator. Uh, so again, using the Hugging Face DLC, uh, in this case, we're pointing to a Git config. So you can point to um, content that's sitting on GitHub, point to scripts sitting on GitHub, um, any you know, Git-based system that you have access to. And uh, you can point to scripts sitting there. And then we're going to pass in the model name, actually. So we'll pass in the name of certain models that we want to use. Uh, we'll pass in the directory. We'll pass in the data set name. And then uh, you're going to run this on a SageMaker training job. So remember, this is a new um, instance that's turning in line in the SageMaker family. We're copying your data from S3 onto that instance. We're calling model.train. Uh, and then we're, again, executing, uh, executing that job. And so uh, you can generate code. Uh, and here is my little video. Essentially, um, we'll, we'll demo this in the webinar. You can compile your models. Uh, so you compile your Huggy Face models using the SageMaker training compiler. Uh, so training compiler is a parameter that you're going to add to this estimator. 
And then for supported models and frameworks, uh, we'll compile your job to up to 50% faster overall train time. Uh, you can also, again, distribute hugging face models across GPUs and clustered nodes. Uh, so this visual is using SageMaker model parallel. So we're adding different parameters to enable model parallel, um, such as the number of partitions to split your model over multiple GPUs, um, how to optimize your or how to uh, shard your optimizer states, uh, different partition settings. And then we're going to pass that into in this case, we use the PyTorch estimator. Uh, there's a version conflict. So we just need to use the PyTorch estimator. And then we passed in a GPTJ script uh, in order to fine tune a GPTJ script. And uh, we've ran some tests at up to 140 P4 instances on SageMaker, uh, where we showed that we were able to uh, train a 175 billion parameter NLP model on SageMaker at 32 samples per second. And uh, we projected if we increase the world size to up to 240 uh, P4 instances, uh, so that's many times more uh, GPUs than we project 25 days to train that model. And then here's my second video uh, where essentially we are uh, showing how to generate the code config uh, to host any pre-trained hugging face model on SageMaker. And then lastly, here's how we can deploy fine-tuned models on SageMaker. So um, this visual is using the code config that we generated uh, for GPT-2. But in this case, I'm going to point to S3. So here I'm pointing to my own model data that's sitting in an S3 bucket. And then I'm going to say model.deploy. Uh, I'm passing in what's called the HF task. So it's the task definition. Uh, for the type of um, NLP task that I'm doing. This time it's text generation, um, but then I'm commenting out the model ID. So you pass in the task, uh, you withhold the model ID, and then point to your data set in S3. Uh, and then that will actually deploy your base model onto your own estimator, uh, onto your own endpoint rather, uh, and then host it. And so with that, uh, we're going to move into the hands-on workshop. So I'm going to pass it over to Frushi. Uh, and Frushi, if you can get us up and running an event engine, that would be lovely. Hey, this is Rushi. I will be going through the overall notebook and the workshop here. And thanks, Emily, for explaining some of the key concepts which will be used or which will be referred always in this workshop. And uh, again, on iterate on iterating on the two modes of delivery of this workshop, there is one way that is you can use your own AWS account and uh, run those notebooks, which Emily talked about. And the other way is to that and there is a administered way of e events, which typically are done by AWS um, representatives, where they will provide you event hash. And using that, I mean, basically you can launch AWS console. It basically creates uh, AWS account for you. And you can run those notebooks and in, I mean run those workshops workshops in your own uh, in that particular account. So assume here that you have got a, uh, a hash for your event, and you have to go to dashboard.eventengine.run where you're logging in using your hash account. So, so I'll post it here and then accept here. So in in your case, you will be registering using your email, so you'll get a one-time password to get login. In my case, I'll be using Amazon Employee. As soon as you log into this, um, you will get to see uh, the option of AWS console. And so here, Hershey, just to, just just to quickly reiterate that, so uh, for folks on the webinar right now, uh, we're going to paste in the hash ID for you. Um, so we're going to paste in that hash ID into the chat. So you should see that now. Uh, and then please go to this URL. So it's dashboard.eventengine.run. And so you go to dashboard.eventengine.run, and then you're going to paste in this hash ID, uh, and then this will show uh, the same page that that you see from Hushi right now. So that's where you should be. Yep, that's right. And once you are on on this particular portal, you have uh, AWS console showing up, and then you click on this AWS console. Um, you can copy this for any CLI related operation, but in this case, in this workshop, we're going to use entirely the AWS console. So I will click on this open AWS console hyperlink. It's going up and opening up a new tab. And once this opens up, 
I will go to Amazon SageMaker service. Okay, can you uh, zoom in a little bit? It's kind of hard for us to see. Let me try. Is it good? I would take a couple more bumps, actually. Um, yeah, so yeah. this is a new console. Yeah, this is a new console which has a high resolution. And now you can go into the Amazon SageMaker service. Great. Um, you Let's... also type in service name here at the field about and let's let's take a look at some of the the account settings so if you look at the top right hand side uh you'll see that we're in north virginia um so yep. just please make sure that you're in north virginia uh with us there we go so usc swan and then on the second view um, you'll also see that you're using um essentially this team role in this uh in this environment uh, and so if you're stepping through this with us in the event engine, um, you'll be in a different account, actually, but your view should be similar. Uh, if you're in your own AWS account, then that'll look like whatever it is it looks like in your account. Yeah, so I think before going dive deep, Emily, we will be going through a little bit of uh, this, this UI on the SageMaker, and you will see that there is a SageMaker domain and studio. That's what we're, we'll be running our notebook instances in. There is another way to run your notebook instances through under notebook, which is very independent. So we would recommend always to use Studio, which is, gives an integrated development environment. Um, Unless you, you can... need Docker. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're if, if if you're building a Docker image, um, then you do want to use the notebook instance directly. Um, or if you're running, uh, say, like a long running process where you're downloading some data, um, then uh, sometimes it's helpful to use notebook instances. But today we're going to use Studio. Yep. And you can also see that there are multiple other nodes here, uh, which are all SageMaker features. And here we'll be focusing on training and inference. So for this particular workshop, I mean, when this uh, event was created, it's already having some pre-created uh, steps. So you'll see that there are a few endpoints being created. Um, Emily, you want to go over those two endpoints and why they, are, they were created here? Yeah, sure. So we have two endpoints uh, that were created in the CloudFormation template. So if you're if you're using Event Engine, uh, then we downloaded these two endpoints for you. Uh, that first one you see is called the multi-model endpoint. Essentially, this has a base GPT-2 model, so a base hugging face model deployed to that endpoint, but it is a multi-model endpoint. So it supports, as you might guess, multiple models. Uh, basically, it has one, one uh, inference image. So one set of requirements, one set of Python dependencies, uh, one invocation script that it uses, um, but then as many models as you want. So it points to a base S3 path um, and then it actually copies those models from S3 onto the endpoint and then loads it into memory to respond to your uh, inference request. So we're gonna um, we're gonna use that in our demo and in the workshop here today. And then the second endpoint is GPTJ. Um, so you may have heard of GPT3. Uh, GPTJ is the open is an attempt at an open source version of GPT3. So uh, it's a very large model. Um, this is the 6 billion parameter version of that model, which is deployed onto a SageMaker endpoint. And we're going to use it to generate some text. And then we'll look at the comparison uh, relative to GPT2. So, and note that, I mean, to add to Emily's point, that note that these two endpoints are running on MLM5 uh, to extra large instances. And that's actually is doing your inference job, inference work. Now let's go back to the uh, studio, which is our the main place where we'll be focusing on running our notebook instances. And you will see that the event engine um, has created a, already a domain called as lab user. And from here, you basically are going to launch the studio uh, Jupyter Lab. So if I click over here, it will take, uh, for the first timers, it will take a little bit of time to uh, log into this one. And so just stay tuned. And yeah, so yes. in, in the in the cloud formation, we actually already created uh, that Jupyter server. So this one-time view is going to be a lot faster because it was already deployed in the event in the cloud formation. Um, but when you create a studio domain your first time, 
uh, then it'll take a couple minutes for the Jupyter server to get created. And one troubleshooting tip here, and um, sometimes what I've seen is that people already logging into their uh, existing account and AWS account. So it's a good idea that you should log out from those accounts. Otherwise, it will conflict with the one which we have created through the event engine. Okay, so let's go into uh, see the uh, structure here. So we, we we have it's a bare minimal notebook instance. So what we'll do is well before doing that, we'll first git clone the repo. So go here and clone a repository. So the one which we have is the hugging phase workshop, uh, which is going to be your, uh, I'll copy the link to this. Let's see here. So this is the one which will be also posting it in the, in the webinar as well. So you can copy this link and just clone this. And when you clone it, you will see the plugin based workshop coming up here. So with this, you will see uh, the folder, which this is the where all the um, folder structure is created. And the one which we'll be focusing here on is going to be, Emily, is it going to be the same without CFN or you want to plug? Yeah, let's, let's do that. We'll, we'll do it without CFN. Okay. Yeah, so we'll open up this without CFN uh, notebook instance here, uh, notebook uh, folder, and we'll be focusing on First, I mean, we'll just do a quick walkthrough, Emily, on the first one. Is that okay? And then we'll do generation two. Uh, let's actually just start with the second one. Second one is good. Okay. Now here, when you open up the notebook uh, instance, so you will see that there are three on the top three are three things here. Uh, so you will be opening up a kernel. So if you see, there is a starting notebook kernel, and this kernel is basically opening up Python three point six PyTorch one point eight CPU Jupyter kernel here. Um, so make sure that. Once it's initialized on the right hand side on the no kernel, you should be seeing the version which has been pointed out here. And let's let's go ahead and set that. So let's oh, just yeah, you can on. also set that. Yeah, there we go. Great. Yeah. So so please click on where it said no kernel. Uh, please click on that, and then uh, let's scroll down, and it's going to say PyTorch one point eight Python three point six CPU. So let's let's get that selected. And we'll hit select. Yep. Great. And then where it says unknown, let's set that to an ml.t3 medium. There we go. Yeah, so we went up to that unknown button. Uh, and then we hit ml.t3.medium. And then let's hit save. And so that's going to take a couple minutes. Um, and the reason it's taking a couple minutes is because it's actually turning on a new instance. So essentially, um, what's unique about Studio, like Studio has uh, obviously a lot of widgets and a lot of features, but it actually lets you run on a ton of EC2 instances. So your Jupyter server, uh, that's one instance that's managed and paid for by Amazon. Uh, so that Jupyter server is, uh, is free to you. Um, that is hosting your UI. And so that's hosting this, this view that we see here with all these widgets and features. What we're doing right now with this individual IPython notebook, we're actually creating another machine. We're creating another instance uh, that this is gonna sit on top of. In the SDK, we call it a kernel gateway application. Uh, and so it's, it's again, like a net new instance. And, and yeah, Hrushi, if, if you click on that little circle widget on the left-hand side and then hit a refresh, well, when it's ready, it'll, it'll show up there. Sure. It's, yeah. it's taking a little bit of time. So, so there are a few more things which, I mean, Emily would be interested to show is that there are some terminals which you can always go and uh, install some packages um, as well as, for example, here, there is a terminal window. Um, and that should be initializing once all this will get initialized. Uh, but as Emily was pointing out, that if you see on the circle button here, you will see those instances showing up. Um, so basically, we have selected MLT3 medium, and that's where our notebook instance is running on. Um, the kernel we have selected is 1.81 CPU. Um, and the kernel session is where we are notebook instance. Uh, so the notebook is going to be executed. Um, right. I think with this, we have two vCPU, four gigs, cluster Python 3 is all optimized, and it's saying, initialized here on the bottom side. So we are good to go on executing those cells. 
Um, but way before that, I mean, Emily, you want to give a quick overview of what we are planning to do here? Yeah, actually, can uh, can you click on that little circle widget again? That'll just minimize that sidebar. Okay. There we go. And then let's get another zoom in on this so we can see it a little bit more easily. All right, there we go. Uh, so in this notebook, we're going to do an extremely complex maneuver. Uh, and I'm, I'm tongue in cheek here because it's not complex. We're going to hit run all. Um, so let's go up to that run button on the all, yeah. all the way up on the top. So we're going to go up to run, run all cells. There we go. Uh, so what we're doing in this notebook um, is text generation. Essentially, we are going to uh, download the Hugging Face SDK and we're going to download a model. Uh, in particular, we're going to download a version of GPT-2 that has been fine tuned for poetry. Um, so it's actually a poetry generation model. So we're going to download that to the studio kernel gateway notebook um, and we're going to execute it locally. We're going to get some inferencing locally. Um, we're going to test it locally. We're going to break it apart. Then uh, we're going to get a new data set, actually. So that new data set, uh, in this case, is going to be from Anne Bradstreet. Um, Anne Bradstreet was actually the first published author in North America. Uh, uh, Bradstreet was a writer from the mid-1600s. Um, and she, uh, yeah, she, she wrote poetry and other things. And so we're going to basically create a new uh, training data set from one of Anne's poems, from one of Bradstreet's poems. Uh, if you're testing this at home, um, outside of the workshop, you can uh, rerun this with your own poet, actually. You can just paste in um, any text that you prefer. Uh, and then uh, what we're going to do is run a fine-tuning job. So we're going to load that data set into S3. And then we're going to run a job on SageMaker. So we're going to run a training job on SageMaker to take that data set, um, actually parse it in the training job and tokenize it there, uh, do the fine tuning uh, using, again, the SageMaker API. And then uh, we're going to download that model after it's finished. We're going to test that locally on some more text. We're going to deploy that model onto a multi-model endpoint. So we have that multi-model endpoint created. We're going to add this model to that multi-model endpoint, and then we're going to test it, and we're going to write poetry. Um, so we're going to uh, basically copy and paste different lines that you like um, into that predictor, and, and we're going to try and write some poetry. Um, there's also a pipeline that we have created, so we'll demo that. Uh, and then we'll also see if we can invoke the GPTJ uh, endpoint and compare some of those predictions with our own. So that's what we're doing. Let's let's see how far we got. Yeah, and if you see here that when when this entire notebook is running, there are a few things which are running. That you can see the monitor that it's running in the running progress. I mean, uh, that indicates that. Uh, there is a dependency on one cell over the other because it's running, uh, the previous cell is running, still running. Okay, so with that, let's go with the step zero where we are installing the transformer SDK locally. Uh, there is a requirement text file. Then we're doing pip install on the requirement text file, which actually is uh, downloading all the SDKs from GitHub uh, with Hugging Face transformers. Um, and you'll see there that it is deploying the 4.6.1 version of transformers. And all the way up here, it's going to download a pre-trained GPT model and we'll test locally first. So yeah, yeah so, these are the specific thing which you're, uh, Emily, you want to point out about this variable? Yeah, so so, th so, um, so again, the Hugging Face model hub, uh, as they call it, has 31, has more than 31,000 pre-trained models. And actually, Hrushi, uh, can you open up a new tab and let's just go look at it. So let's just type in hugging face models. And then, yeah, let's click there. So this is the hugging face model hub. Um, they have 32,600 pre-trained models. Um, let's type in GPT-2. Yeah, 
in that search bar. Yeah, so there are a lot of versions of GPT-2. Um, you have a Distilla GPT-2, uh, which came out somewhat recently. Um, you have other versions of GPT-2. Uh, they come in small versions. They come in large versions. Um, some of them are fine-tuned. Some of them are created by, by others. Um, let's type in uh, poems, actually. Let's see if we, if we get a response on poem. Yeah, uh, so there are a lot of GPT-2 models that have already been fine-tuned for poetry. Um, so some of them are in different languages, right? There's a Chinese poem generator. Um, there's a Hungarian poem generator. I've seen uh, Italian poems. I, there are, you know, some in, in just many different languages. Um, so those have been fine-tuned per language. The model that we are generating is that one, yeah. And so, so this one... Um, is a collection of uh, multiple poems, um, and we're going to, <coughs> excuse me, multiple English poems. And so we're going to um, use this model, and uh, let's check this out. So actually, if you go on the right-hand side in this view, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. click on Use in Transformers. So we'll click on Use in Transformers, and then you'll see it starts uh, with that base syntax, which is, from transformers, we're gonna import this thing called an auto tokenizer and then an auto model for, for causal language modeling. Uh, so a tokenizer is something we need in every Hugging Face project. And what's really nice about the hub is that um, the majority of models, if not all the models, also have a tokenizer associated with it. So you can download that model and you can download the tokenizer for that model just by passing the name. So that's exactly what we're doing is our, in our notebook is we're copying um, and then downloading that model to our notebook. Uh, and then, yeah, let's, let's go back to the notebook and then we'll see how to use that model object locally. So you'll see we downloaded it. Uh, so we're downloading again this tokenizer um, and then the model. Great. And so now we have this base GPT-2 poem model. And so, um, and I mean, one, this, thing, one thing we want to highlight here is about caching. I mean, how many times do you have to like keep downloading? Is it something? Oh, uh, yeah, impacts? no, great, great call out. Um, they cache it for you, it's so nice. So, when you download it, um, they actually download it to uh, like this local hugging face cache that they have. Um, and then uh, when you when you run that cell again, it won't just download it from GitHub, it'll actually look in the cache first. And then if it's already in the cache, uh, then it will just use it rather than downloading it again. It's super nice. And, and same thing applies for the data set as well, right, Emily? Correct, yeah. So um, another step we could have done is actually downloading the data set um, that's relevant for any of the models using the data sets SDK. And it does exactly the same thing. Okay. We'll go to the next, uh, cell number five here. Here, I think um, we are specifically Defining few things, functions here. Um, I think defining on the tokenizer side. Yeah. So you know, so so basically, um, so there's a little outputs function just to like nicely print and nicely render the the output. Um, but so essentially, uh, we're gonna set a seed here just to make sure that we get consistent results. Um, so if uh, so for for folks at home. If you are using a C to 42 and we are using a C to 42 on the same model and the same request string, then we'll get the same response string. And so we're going to pass in uh, the, um, the conditional text. So GPT-2 uh, stands for generative, generative pre-trained transformers. It is a conditional generation model. It takes an input string and then it tries to generate the next number of words or the next tokens um, in that string. And so uh, we'll take in that text and then we're gonna put the text in the tokenizer. So again, that tokenizer is um, the same tokenizer we downloaded. And then we're gonna get those tokenized input IDs and we're gonna put them into the base model. Um, so then we say model.generate on that input IDs. Uh, we're gonna set the max length 
So the maximum length in, in terms of number of characters that's coming out of that model is set to 70. And then we're gonna set the number of return sentences to five. Uh, and so we'll get actually five sentences returned back. And then uh, let's actually look at this. Yeah, there's an example like five sentences out. And this was mainly talking about that it's truncating the remaining up to 70 characters. Yes, or, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, but so we can we can kind of kind of read this a little bit. So so the first one, the zeroth one, so a rose by any other name, right? That's the conditional, and then the model comes up with uh, I name, and then for beauty is above all sorrow, and shamefulness is an ugly thing, uh, and which which actually sounds like poetry, so that's pretty good, yes. right? <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, again that's because we used a GPT two model that was already fine-tuned on poetry. Um, so because it was already fine-tuned on poetry, uh, it's able to generate um, content that seems like poetry, like the lines are short. Uh, it has, you know, maybe five, uh, four or five words per line. Um, and then the model is actually generating that new line. It's actually suggesting that there are new lines in this poem so that it looks, uh, it, it definitely looks like a poem. Yeah. So let, let's. Know. Yep. That's an interesting one. I think that's what I mean, Emily. Here, what we are going to do is to make it based on our style of author, right? I mean, what we want to modify this is these outputs in a in our styles. Correct. Our, style. so. Yes. So now uh, we're going to pick our own author, and just for the sake of argument, we're going to pick the first published author for North America. So we'll pick Anne Bradstreet. And uh, actually, if you want to click on that little those little three dots where it says writing, no, no, no below. Um, yeah. yeah, so what we've done is we've just literally copied a poem by Anne Bradstreet from uh, publicdomainpoetry.com, uh, so nice and easy. And um, yeah, so I, I uh, just pasted that poem in here, <clears throat> excuse me, and then at the top of the cell, um, you'll see there's that uh, two little percentage signs, those two mod signs. And so we're just creating this file. We're just writing this new file, train.txt, um, and we're just pasting in this poem. So just a net new poem uh, we're going to paste in here. And yeah, let's uh, let's see that. So if we click on the data widget. Uh, yep. And you'll yep. see that there's a train.txt here. There we go. It's the same thing. I mean, you can see and open up and look at this. Yep. Cool. Great. Yeah, let's close that out again. There we go. And so uh, an easy way to minimize this uh, is actually to click on that blue bar on the left hand side. So if you just click on that glowing blue bar, yep, then that will minimize. Perfect. So then let, let's scroll back up again to look at some of the pre-processing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, so the way we're going to train this data set on Hugging Face is we're going to use a script that was written by Hugging Face, actually. So we're using a, uh, it's called Run CLM script that's sitting on the Hugging Face repository. And fortunately for us, we can pass in uh, generic text. Like we don't have to tokenize it we can just pass in the text. So that's what this cell is doing, is just reading that file, um, stripping off all the new lines, and then just making sure that we're only grabbing like the actual uh, lines and not just the, the base new lines. So, so that's what that cell is. Um, and then it's just gonna tell us that it found um, 300 valid objects in that data set, and then here's a view. Um, so just the first 10 lines are indeed um, valid, uh, valid verses uh, by Bradstreet. I mean, to be, uh, to confirm here, the, the four, 304 valid objects are basically like sentences. Is that what it talks about? They are lines. Yes, lines. they're, so they're line. individual lines. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to the cell number 10 now, where we are importing SageMaker and we are basically making sure that the environment is set correctly. It actually has all the session roles because note that Studio Notebook is running using an IAM role, and that is where it uses, and that role, IAM role is used to ex 
access S3 bucket or write to S3 bucket. And those are all initialized or read here in this particular cell. Yep. And we we do you do you want me Emily to show this three bucket location and other stuff here? We'll do that in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So the output of this is the train.txt, which you have seen here in this folder, is basically copied to the S3 bucket under this uh, prefix GPT2. Um, and the file name is train.txt. Great. So then now let's scroll down and let's unpack this thing. Um, so first, let's go down to the estimator. And actually, let's check this out. So, so say we wanted to do this at home. And how would we get this whole gnarly script? And how would we get this gnarly script for a different model? Let's go back to the Hugging Face Hub. Great. And now let's close out this view. And now let's go to train. Uh, so, yep, down, down on the right hand side. Oh, train this one? Yeah, there we go. So, train, yep. And then we're going to click Amazon SageMaker. And then uh, we're going to go to task and let's click on that drop down. So first off, there are a ton of different tasks. Um, so GPT-2 is most famous for generation, but um, something you'll come to find out is that many transformer models, like the base model, can support a variety of different downstream tasks. So it's very common um, to fine tune a, ta a model on a task, um, even if that wasn't like explicitly what it was trained for. So we'll pick text classification, but just note that you can use a variety of different models. Yeah. So text classification, check. And then under config, let's give that a click and we're going to pick AWS. So let's pick AWS. And then what do you know? So, so they actually generate the config code uh, to run this model on a SageMaker estimator. So let's scroll down. So there's that hyperparameters object. And then what do you know? So there's a git config. Uh, and so essentially, um, yeah, there we go. So that git config is literally pointing to um, the Hugging Face GitHub repository. So it's pointing to Hugging Face's GitHub repository and their transformers git repository on v4.6.1. And then mm -hmm. uh, within that, there's a, a source directory, which is the path within that repository. Um, and so you can do this locally, right? So with the SageMaker estimators, you can point to a script that's sitting on your local notebook, or you can point to scripts that are sitting in GitHub. And that's just what this path is. Um, so source directory is we're pointing to that, that path in the directory and then entry point um, is running uh, this specific task. Oh, and actually, uh, okay, so we picked text classification, but we actually wanted was text generation. So let's switch that out. Yeah, so let's pick text generation. <laughs> Which it isn't here, that's ironic. Oh, causal language modeling, mm -hmm. that's what we Yeah, want. this is what we used, yeah. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Uh, so now we see run CLM. Yeah. Run CLM. So, yep. so causal language modeling um, essentially means that we're using an encoder only architecture. Uh, if you want more details on that, read the book, check out the videos, check out the notebook instances or the notebooks. Um, but it means we are generating code by and large. Mass language modeling means we're using primarily an encoder architecture. Um, that is actually masking uh, different words um, and different tokens and then trying to predict the tokens, which then learns um, the meaning of those tokens relative to each other versus causal language modeling is just trying to generate the next word in each sequence. And so it's going like only right to left, whereas mass language modeling is going both right to left. And that's why they call it bi-directional. So in any case, um, so we're generating the config for this. And then what you can do is just click copy. So you can just press copy. And then we'll go back to studio. 
And then if we wanted to, we could just press paste, but it's it's already been pasted in, so we won't do that. Um, so a couple parameters you wanna add when you're doing this. Um, the first, So you'll see the in that hyperparameters object, so it already has the poem's name. Um, great. Uh, it has the output directory for OptML. You want to tell it to train, actually. So you need to pass this do train parameter. Uh, so you want to add that. You need to add the training file. Um, and so the training file is the director is the location of your training set on your training container, actually. So in the SageMaker training image, um, OptML is where all the code sits. And then input slash data slash train is your training channel. And so then we're going to add the uh, training file name and we'll just we'll just get that added in to the hyper. Yeah, so basically it's and it's pointing out to this training file name, which is train.txt, which we copied to the S3 location, right? Exactly. Right. Yes. Great. Uh, and then we're setting number of train epochs. Um, so we'll train for five epochs. And we're setting our batch size to a really big number. Uh, and so the reason we get to train with a batch size of 64, um, which is uncommon in NLP, it's more common to set batch sizes to, to something smaller, um, is because we're using tr SageMaker Training Compiler. Um, so you'll notice that we also imported um, this Training Compiler config. So Training Compiler is a feature we launched at reInvent uh, 2021. And it will um, work really nicely with your hugging face model. So if you're using the trainer API and uh, within the hugging face SDK, if you're using that trainer API, then compiling your model is literally a one line of code addition. Um, you add in that training compiler config um, to the hugging face estimator and it will uh, it will just shrink your model. We'll compile your model. We look at the operators that are defined in your model, um, and then we try and place them on the device, uh, on the GPU that you're using um, in a more efficient manner. And specifically, it reduces the memory footprint of your model and just literally shrinks it. So if your model was like one, two GB in size, uh, sitting in memory, then that footprint is just going to be smaller um, as a result of using the compiler. And the reason we care about that is that that, that makes our job run faster. So training compiler uh, is going to make your model, your job, um, the overall runtime of your job can be up to 50% 50 50 faster um, using training compiler. And so that's why we added it in here. So great. great. Um, yeah, so then we'll look at the estimator. Uh, so we've got the hugging face estimator. And again, we're, we're setting that entry with one causal language modeling. Uh, and then we have our source directory defined. Uh, in this case, we're sitting on one p3.2xl. So remember, this is a new instance. Um, this is a new machine that is turning online. It is not our notebook. It is not studio. It is a net new GPU. Uh, that is going to come online in our account um, and is going to run for about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit less. And so we pass in this one GPU. Uh, we pass in the version of Transformers that we need, so 4.11, the PyTorch version, 1.9, uh, the hyperparameters we're working with, um, the compiler config, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, we say hugging face estimator dot fit down at the bottom. And then we create what's called a training channel. Uh, and so your channel um, is actually what you create. So you say train, and then that's how you set the name of the channel to train. So you're creating a train channel right there. Uh, and then the most common thing is to send in an S3 path. Um, so we're passing in the location of that object that's sitting in S3. Remember, we created that just in the cell above. And so we're passing in this S3 uh, path. Yeah, there we go. And so that file is literally getting copied onto the training container. Uh, it's getting copied onto that instance, onto that machine. Um, and then SageMaker is executing dot train on that. And so now, uh, we can look at the logs 
and we can view the logs in studio. However, and one thing, and one oh, thing yeah, I just want to add, add to here is that these three th important things are for the image to be pulled on which the training scripts will be used, right? Um, do you want a little bit of highlight on this deep learning? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So it's it's using the deep learning containers. Um, it's using a pre-built container that is available in different versions of Python and different versions of frameworks. Um, so we have um, deep learning container. And actually, you can just go to the page if you want to show people where it yeah. is. So if you just open a new web browser tab uh, and then just type in GitHub deep learning containers. There we go, bam. Uh, and so we have uh, more than 70 containers that work nicely on AWS. So I definitely wanna stress this. We battle test all of these machines. Um, we make sure that they work nicely, that they're updated, um, that they are integrated with the rest of the SageMaker stack and the rest of the AWS stack. Um, we, uh, work with the uh, SageMaker model parallel and data parallel libraries in addition to training compiler um, to deliver all the performance enhancements. So if you're training on SageMaker, um, strongly recommend that you consider using the deep learning containers. Um, using them is really easy. When you use that uh, estimator object, you are, um, and then when you point to the different versions of the frameworks that you want, we're actually grabbing the deep learning container in the backends based on that estimator and based on your versions. And then we're just adding your scripts on top. So like we import that deep learning container as a base and then we add your scripts on top. Um, if you want to build your own Docker container, so if you wanna say spin up SageMaker notebook instances and then like build a Docker image um, from scratch, you can extend our containers. So the recommendation for that is to in your Docker file, just at the top of the line, have a from statement and say from the AWS deep learning containers, and then just paste in um, our image as a base and then just extend it with the rest of your content. Um, and then that way you can build your own image and add in your own like, you know, uh, operating system and Linux level requirements um, that are maybe that are non pip installable. Um, but you can still use, again, these pre-shipped images that work really nicely on AWS. So those are the yep. different And you can see all the different container images also from our website here um, that actually has a list of all the containers in which location DCR repositories. Yep. Okay, we'll go back again to the training and you will see here that it's downloading the image, putting the script, um, initiating the instance, so those are in progress. Yeah, and uh, Hershey, is, is there another place we can find all this metadata? This meta should be there in the training job itself, right? And in the logs. Yeah, let's actually view that. Like, let's open up a new tab and just look at the AWS console that we're in? You know, at, at this point, you can just type console AWS. You don't have to go through that even dashboard thing because you already logged in and you have the session. So you go here, SageMaker service. You can also type SageMaker service at the top. And then in the training jobs, you will see that there's one job. Yeah, so, so we, we yeah. went back to AWS console. Um, then we clicked on SageMaker. And then under SageMaker, we went down to the left-hand side and then it's under training and you click on training jobs. So under training, we click on training jobs and then that will show you any jobs you've run. And so you should show uh, right now this new job. So let's click on that and then evaluate it. So one thing that's super nice about SageMaker training is that every model you train using this API construct with the estimator, um, all the metadata for it is stored. Uh, the job name, the instance type you're using, the hyperparameters, um, the logs, the model artifact, the training data, all of it is stored. So it's reproducible. Um, it's actually searchable. Uh, you can share the content with other people. Um, it just makes it a lot easier to continue your experiments um, because, again, all the metadata is stored. Yeah, so all the hyperparameters 
for this are stored. Um, and then we can scroll down and we can even look at the logs. Uh, so let's go to actually up a little bit to that monitor tab. And then uh, we want to look at view logs. So it's just a little bit higher. Oh, yeah. So so it's in monitor. Um, and then it should be a button that says view logs. Yeah, yeah. and the logs now you can see. Okay, <clears throat> great. Yeah. So then so once you click on view logs, uh, then let's go to that log stream down at the bottom. And let's give that a click. Great. And so this is the the action, right? This is the play by play of your model that's training. And so uh, at the bottom, it's showing success and it's showing the epochs, uh, your train loss, your train runtime. Uh, but let's scroll up and just take a look at that beginning part. Yeah, there we go. And then if we, we let's click load more uh, and let's just do that until we get to the the beginning of the log stream. Yeah, so um, so that using XLA device that tells us that it's using the training compiler. That like training compiler has been enabled. But even before that, um, it's going to show us uh, a couple other sort of metadata pieces. So so let's let's scroll up even further. And go a little bit higher. You want up. to say go before the downloading button? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah. It's even before that. And let's let's keep going until we get to the very top. Yep. This there is we go. The... Perfect. So the first thing SageMaker is doing is installing all of the requirements. Um, so here it's installing requirements um, as defined by that repository. Um, but you can also, again, do this locally. So when you're bringing your own scripts, um, you can just bring your own requirements.txt, and then it all gets installed in that training container. And then let's scroll past the, the installs. So after the installs, then uh, there's a training environment print. So this is how SageMaker actually works, like on the training side. We have uh, environment variables. So we have environment variables for uh, your entry point, for your input training data, for your channels, um, your input directory, your output directory, number of CPUs, number of GPUs, all sorts of things. And so in the training scripts that you use, um, the most common thing is to look at um, the arg parser, actually. It's like read through arg parser um, and then look up default values um, on the environment variables and then just read the value from the environment variable. Yeah, so there's the, the execution with all those arg, args added to it. Uh, and then look up um, through arg parser Again, where your data is sitting, uh, where your model is sitting, et cetera, um, and then use that to actually execute your training script. So once you have that initialized and then you call train in your main script, um, then it just starts the training process. And so again, this is using that hugging face um, script for run CLM, which is uh, executing the trainer. So it's using their trainer API to execute this content. Okay, so go back to this. Um, do you want me to collapse this one? Yeah, we, we can just scroll to the bottom, whatever works. Oops. Great. So let's let's scroll up a little bit. We 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 just we just jumped. Yeah. So after the model has finished training. Let's see what happens. So let's scroll up a bit. Now we are here. Actually, no, 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 actually up, up quite a bit. No, I think we have to go down here, right? Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> <laughs> yep, let, let's keep going up. There we go. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> there we go. Perfect. No worries. So yeah. so we, we train the model. 
Uh, and then after the logs are completed, we can minimize the logs, no worries. And then we're at step four, test your trained model locally. So this uh, line is just grabbing the model data from the estimator. Um, so again, from that estimator, uh, we're gonna grab the S3 path. If you needed to restart your kernel, um, then there's a line I commented out above that where it says hugging face dot attach. So you can actually attach a training job to that estimator object uh, in that comment. Yep, right there. Uh, and so if you need to like restart your kernel, um, then you can uh, you can use that attach line. But in this case, we didn't need to. So then we're just going to point to the uh, to the S3 path. And then uh, we're going to create a local directory called GPT-2 underscore fine tuned. And then we're going to copy the model data from S3 into that local directory. Yeah, so GPT-2 fine tuned. There we go. Yep. Exactly. And so we copied um, the content from S3 into this path. And next, we're going to load this into a uh, the Transformers SDK uh, framework, and we're going to get some results from it. So uh, we use that same tokenizer, actually, so the exact same tokenizer as before, because remember, it's a GPT-2 model. So we've got the same tokenizer. Actually, it's above this, just a couple of cells. Sorry. No worries. Yep. Um... There we go. Yep. yep. So, so the same tokenizer as before, and then uh, the same object. So, auto model for causal LM from pre-trained. But now we're pointing to that local model path. So now we're pointing to that local directory um, where we have all those objects. And then there's a step you can run called model.eval. Yeah, which shows you um, that your model is is basically valid, uh, that it's a valid object, uh, gives you all of the information about it, and tells you that it's ready for inferencing. So it's a GPT-2 uh, language head model. So, cool. so when you talk about, Emily, the local mode, that means we are not spinning up a, a separate instance for inference. It's all inference is happening locally in that notebook instance, right? Uh, we're doing both. We're doing some oh. inferencing locally, and we're doing some inferencing on an endpoint. Got it. Yeah, we are testing it locally, and then we'll be going to deploying it. it. Correct. Deploying yeah, it. so whenever you're ready, we can just minimize that again. Yep. Perfect. Now, speed, so. yep, and now we're going to run um, basically the same um, code as last time where we take the text, put the text into the tokenizer, put those input IDs into that model, call model.generate, and then get the outputs. And the outputs are basically rerunning re re it through the tokenizer to convert the tokens back into text. But um, it's different, so. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So, so definitely different. Um, Anne Bradstreet's style is very old English, right? She, um, she obviously is a writer from the from the mid 1600s. Um, so uh, yeah, she's actually just after Shakespeare um, in in terms of their their lineage. Um, but she, uh, yeah, her style is is kind of very old, very classic English, and and she has this like sort of broad um, broad like almost Puritan view on on some things. And so so you can see in her style, there's this word like sweet breath, um, full freshening, and then the lilies lace growing. So like it it seems to be, um, it's obviously different and maybe a little bit more like Anne Bradstreet. But then in the next couple cells, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass in different parameters to that model.generate line. So now uh, we're gonna go to model.generate we're going to add a couple different parameters. Um, so the first one, top P uh, equal to 0 0.8, means only pick tokens at and above this probability level. Um, so your model is looking at all of the tokens in its vocabulary. 
uh, which you'll actually see vocabulary is a part of the objects in that model. Um, so it's looking at all the tokens in its vocabulary, and it's going to only pick tokens that have at least an 85 probability level. Uh, and then mm -hmm. top K means only pick from this many tokens. So like only grab 200 tokens uh, and then pick from that many tokens. And so we'll run that and let's see what results we get. So, so again, we're still providing that arose by any other name as the conditional input string. Um, but then, okay, clearly different. So just because she will die someday, some may say it's the beauty, uh, and on and on, but that money can't buy you happiness. So, so clearly mm -hmm. um, the, the probability level uh, means it's, it's uh, again, a word that it's more confident of, but in this case, I think it's actually like the base GPT model that's coming in um, because our, our fine tuning set isn't massive. Actually, our fine tuning set is pretty small. Uh, in most cases, you'll fine tune with uh, a good bit more uh, data than that. And so, I think the next, so the next year you're making it 0.95 and top 100k. So you're narrowing it down further, right? Correct, exactly. Yeah. And then. That's also a difference a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So quite a difference. Um, in some cases, seems even less like old English. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yep. Okay. So, uh, so what what we were doing there was kind of qualitative analysis, is looking at the outputs of the model and then trying to talk about it and, and trying to consider qualitatively um, you know, what the, the output is and how that is similar to and different from Anne Bradstreet. And if you took an English lit class, that's, uh, that's kind of what that is, right? It's like literary analysis um, where we like think about you know, what the style of the text is and try and describe it and then consider if it's similar to or different from a different text. Uh, given that we are all aspiring data scientists, uh, it's appropriate for us to do that, but we also want to use a quantitative measure. Um, we want to use an actual metric that can tell us, you know, is this text literally, you know, more or less uh, like that. Now, in text classification, in named entity recognition, in question answering, um, there are some better metrics, actually, um, for uh, this. Personally, I think that text generation does not have great uh, quality metrics. There are uh, like the most common metrics people use are blue um, or rogue or, or sacre bleu or meteor. Um, and But many of them are actually uh, metrics that are designed for translation, where they look at these short input strings and they compare them with the translated result. And they'll do like a precision analysis, like literally how many how many words um, from the input string are in the output string. Uh, and so what I did was I trained a model. Uh, so I trained a text classifier to uh, tell us how much like Anne Bradstreet a given string is. Now I did a trick uh, on this, which was my negative training data that I provided here is actually the result of GPT-2. Um, so I, what I did was I literally copied all of the Anne Bradstreet um, poems that I could get my hands on. And there were about 40 of these. Um, mm -hmm. And then I got that into a training set. And then I also, uh, like I literally looped through that and uh, hit a SageMaker endpoint on GPT-2 to uh, get what GPT-2's response was on the Anne Bradstreet text. And then with my positive and negative sets, um, I trained a classifier. So I trained a, a classifier and then I pushed it on the hub. So actually, Hirsch, if you go back up to where we're importing that model, um, so you'll see, uh, yeah, so edubs dash Ann Bradstreet, that is my model that I pushed for this workshop. Um, and so I just pushed it directly to the hub and then you can load it here, right? So we're using that auto tokenizer and we're gonna load that model. However, I want to load it for sequence classification. So we're going to use a different object, auto model for sequence classification dot from pre-trained, and then we'll load that in. So now we have a classifier to tell us if something looks like Anne Bradstreet 
or if it looks like it was coming from GPT-2. And it's actually really good. <laughs> like this model like really knows what Anne Bradstreet is versus GPT-2. I was very pleasantly surprised. <laughs> it turned out really well. Um, so, so if we scroll down, then this next function um, is invoking that model locally. So it takes um, an input text, uh, runs it through the tokenizer. So this and tokenizer runs it through this and classifier to get the outputs. Um, the outputs on this were actually logits, uh, which was was kind of interesting to solve for. So uh, so you get this logits object, which I then had to manually put into a softmax function right here uh, to get the uh, to get the confidence level basically, which is was the maximum of those two. Um, and then grab the index on that, which is the the label and then the confidence score. And so that's what that function does. And then you can invoke locally um, any uh, any string you want to. Yeah. So if you if you see that, um, then it's running a line that is from Ann Bradstreet, and the confidence is super high, uh, where the label is saying like, yes, this is Ann. Um, and then we pass in some Shakespeare. Uh, right, a rose by any other name is Shakespeare, and the confidence level is still pretty high that it's not Anne Bradstreet. Um, and so, folks at home, if you want to, um, you can actually like in in that line, like Krushi, um, you can paste in something else. Um, so you can, I don't know, let's let's paste in like, wow, I am enjoying this workshop or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> And then just run that line. Not there right. we go. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not and. <laughs> so, so cool. So folks at home, you, you could definitely try that out. All right. Thanks, Rushi. And so now I'm going to show the last part of the workshop directly. Uh, and that's where we're going to deploy our fine-tuned model onto a SageMaker multi-model endpoint. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to go with me, and we're going to click on our data widget right up here. And then you'll see we're still in that Hugging Face workshop without CFN directory. We're going to click on this first one, deploy GPT-2 GPTJ. So we'll open up this first notebook. And then uh, we're going to set the kernel here. We're going to set uh, under image. I'm going to go down and we're going to click on PyTorch 1.8, Python 3.6. So let's give that a click. And we're going to say select. And then that should come up pretty quickly. Remember, that's because we already have that uh, kernel running. And then we're going to do uh, that complex maneuver. We're going to go up to run. We'll click on run. I'm going to say run all cells. So run all cells here. And so this notebook uh, is going to kick off a job specifically to create our endpoints. Uh, so we're initializing SageMaker. Uh, this one is actually loading uh, a generic GPT-2 model, so it's not the uh, it's not the POA model. It's just the base GPT-2 model. And then we're going to uh, load this. We're actually going to write it to disk. So after we've saved the model and saved the tokenizer to this new GPT-2 dash model path that you see right here. So with that written, uh, we're going to close this and write it. Uh, once that's completed, then uh, we're going to wrap this in a tarball, archive it, and we're going to copy it out to S3. So there's a copy of actually two models. It's, uh, it's just a direct copy on the same model. Uh, so we're going to copy that out to S3. Then we're going to look up the inference deep learning container. So we mentioned deep learning containers. Um, this time we are pointing to the inference. So an inference deep learning container uh, for hugging face. 
under these versions. So we're going to look up that image. And then uh, we're going to create this hub object, and that's the hub parameters. And we're going to tell Hugging Face we want a text generation image, actually. And so we're going to use their uh, text generation script. So that comes in here. Then uh, we're going to create a multi data model. So a multi data model in SageMaker is a multi model endpoint. Uh, and what's happening is we're going to create one image. So again, that inference dot inference image that we used up here relative to text generation, but then as many models as we can get our hands on. So we're going to host the models in S3, but the inferencing image actually is going to sit on the SageMaker endpoint. And so uh, once this model is online and this endpoint is invoked, and actually, if uh, if you run into this issue at home, folks, um, which hopefully you did not, uh, the way you get around this is by changing the number. I've been running this a few times. So I'm going to update that model, and it's going to deploy me a new resource. Uh, so we want to get this resource deployed. Hopefully that just works smoothly on your end. And so uh, what's happening is that as many models as we like are sitting in S3. However, the inferencing endpoint is hosting one script. So again, that's one script for n number of models. And now this is attractive because I can point my application to a single endpoint, but then my application can invoke whatever model it is I want to use. So if I want to use the Anne Bradstreet or the poem or the uh, playwrights, you know, whatever uh, type of script I'm trying to write, like literal scripts, um, I can just point to uh, I can just point to that one endpoint. And so uh, this is actually a seven minute process for this endpoint to turn online. So let's open up the console page. Let's just take a look at this. You can just type in the word console. And then I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to click on SageMaker. And then within SageMaker, I'm going to come down here. I'm going to look at inference. So again, it's under inference. And then under inference, endpoints. And now you'll see I have a few. <laughs> I already have a few endpoints. So I have a multi-model endpoint that I deployed via CloudFormation. I also have this GPTJ model that I deployed via CloudFormation. And now I have this new model that I've just created manually. And that's still in the process of creating. So that's going to take a couple more minutes. Uh, while this comes online, I'd like to show you uh, in our repository. So in that samples uh, in the Hugging Face workshop repository, uh, there's a notebook I'd like to show you, which is called the use cases. So use cases in this main folder. And my hope is that this can actually help you pick the right hugging face model. So if you're sitting here thinking, this looks awesome, but what if I want to do text classification or question answering or named entity recognition or text summarization? or translation or computer vision, uh, you can actually solve all of those use cases using Hugging Face. Um, the models will change, but generally the SDK is going to be the same. Uh, the objects are going to be the same. The uh, scripts to use many of those objects are very similar. Uh, I also have some frequently asked questions for you. Um, so definitely my customers, uh, want to know, do they need big models? Do they need small models? Does size matter in NLP? Um, and the, the answer is like generally yes. Um, bigger models are known to be more intelligent, actually. So uh, this is especially true in text generation. So if you're trying to generate state-of-the-art text, you want a model that's frequently 175 billion parameters at least. Uh, is is where customers tend to go. Now, you don't need to worry about that size, uh, 175 specifically, 
unless you are pre-training. So if you want to pre-train a model, uh, which is to say, use terabytes of your own data sets and then uh, execute pre-training, you can do that on SageMaker and you can do that with Hugging Face. But if you're not doing that, uh, then you can typically get away with a smaller model that's maybe in 1.53 billion parameters, somewhere like that. Uh, so it's really common to pre-train models. Um, use a pre-trained model. Sometimes you can just use it directly. Uh, it's more common to fine-tune it, actually. Typically, fine-tuning is where you're going to see that state-of-the-art performance. Again, you can train your model from scratch. Um, you should plan on NLP models being biased. Uh, NLP models these days are going to pick up the same bias uh, that's present in that data set. So it's very well documented. Um, plan on there being some level of bias in your model. Um, you can use uh, SageMaker Clarify to detect and monitor for bias in text classification. So for classifier specifically, um, you can plug into Clarify to detect and then monitor uh, for bias. And then we also have a curated list of example notebooks. So there are more than 46 example notebooks built by Hugging Face and AWS um, that get you started with PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, work with SageMaker training capabilities, data parallel, model parallel, hyperparameter tuning, spot instances, um, SageMaker hosting to, again, deploy pre-trained models directly from the Hugging Face hub, um, to deploy and auto scale your endpoints, set up serverless inference, uh, asynchronous inference, and then pipelines. So you can build pipelines, uh, you can optimize with the inference recommender, compile with SageMaker Neo, um, set up for SageMaker Inferentia, all sorts of goodness. And then again, SageMaker Clarify to detect and monitor for bias. And so this notebook is yours. Uh, please feel free to, to use it as you see fit. And with that, uh, let's go back to the AWS console and let's make sure that, bam, great. Okay, so now we have uh, this new endpoints that's showing online. Let's see if we can invoke it. So now I'm gonna go back to my uh, second notebook. So the uh, to and then underscore generate text. Deploy your fine-tuned model onto a SageMaker multi-model endpoint. And uh, remember, we just reran uh, that first notebook and we created a multi-model endpoint. Now, what happened um, is that our kernel actually restarted as a result of creating that second notebook pointing to the same kernel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rerun this content here. Let me zoom in, just I've got a nice visual. So I'm gonna rerun uh, this first line here, which import some of those basic objects. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna package up that model and we're going to load that. We're gonna load it onto S3 for the multi-model endpoint. So I'm saving it in this path, gpt2-bradstreet-model. You'll see that right out here. So GPT-2 dash Bradstreet dash model. And then, and actually, yeah. And then uh, in this next line, we're gonna run that. And on your end, it's gonna see say this Bradstreet path, and it's gonna have that inside of these curly brackets. We're gonna tar that. And so, again, what's happening is we're pointing to using this tar file or this tar command. We're pointing to this Bradstreet model and we're packaging it to go inside of this tar.gz archive, which is what SageMaker prefers. So, we're going to wrap that. And there we go. Great. All right. So, now it's, it's wrapped. We're going to load it into S3. So again, S3 copy. And we're gonna copy it from, uh, again, that local name now, which is gpt2-bradstreet-model. We're gonna copy it onto S3 in that path. Now we're gonna point to that endpoint. 
So I'm going to get my endpoints listed. And in particular, I'm going to point to this MME. So that MME endpoint. And now I'm going to point to that endpoint and I'm going to wrap it in this predictor object. So it's wrapped in that predictor object. And now we're going to invoke it. And so uh, this definitely doesn't look like GPT-2. Uh, this looks more like Anne Bradstreet, right? It's got some of that old English. So let's run this again. All right. And so now we're going to do freestyle. So uh, for the remainder of the time here, uh, feel free to uh, to write your poem as as best you see fit. So go ahead and, and run um, some of these lines. You can generate text from that. And then uh, feel free to copy um, lines from here. So let's let's copy this and see what happens. And then just put that into the text. So just copy your your preferred line in there. And then run it against that endpoint and we'll get our model back. And if you had multiple models sitting on this endpoint, what you could do is pass in a new name. So you'd point to a different model uh, and you get the results back. And so uh, we're gonna close the webinar here, uh, but the accounts are actually gonna be active for the rest of the day. So throughout the rest of the day, um, if you want to invoke your GPT-2 model, uh, feel free to do that. Remember that's sitting out here on SageMaker. Uh, and that's sitting in your inferencing uh, section. So you have your GPTJ model alive and well. Uh, you also have a pipeline, actually. So if you go to that little triangle uh, widget down here and then come up and look at pipelines, uh, you can see that we have a poetry of NLP uh, pipeline for you. So I'm going to open that in details and we'll look at the graph. And so uh, you'll see we have a little pipeline here uh, for deploying models. And so that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed your hugging face on SageMaker Workshop, alias the poetry of NLP. Um, and again, uh, my name is Emily Weber. Huge shout out to, to everyone who assisted um, both for putting together the workshop and then for the execution. Uh, feel free to, to ping us if you have questions. Um, my email is just egweber at amazon.com. More than happy to chat with customers about best practices in the space. Uh, so with that, have a great rest of your day. Bye.